it's not worrying so much about step seven, right? Like today, you need to worry about step one. Like you need to do one thing today. If you're a creative person, if you're a baker, a dancer, a photographer, a screenwriter, an actor, a comedian, a podcaster, and you want to figure out how to make a living doing what you love, this is the show. This is the show. Don't keep your day job. My name is Kathy Heller, and I'm a singer-songwriter. I make a living doing what I love, and I want that for you. This is the show that's going to help you do that and give you not only inspiration, but some real-life strategies. This is going to help you figure out how to take your creative passion and turn it into a profit. Hey guys, this is Kathy Heller and welcome back to another episode of Don't Keep Your Day Job. I just want to tell you that I wake up every single day thinking about this show, I go to sleep thinking about this show, and it's because of you. It's because of all the letters that I've been getting, the emails, the packages, the people coming to our Facebook page and telling me that the show is making a difference. The show is helping you take risks and I just want you to know It is so incredibly inspiring to me and I'm so grateful that you guys are here, but I'm so happy that you are being reminded of what you can do because that is the reason I wanted to start this show. I've been doing these meetings over Zoom and I've been meeting with people and I've been talking to people about what they want to do and the thing that's so obvious is that it's all doable. I know there are times when we get in our head and it's so easy to go to the lowest common denominator. It's so easy to feel like it's not going to happen. There's so many people around us who've never taken chances. There's so many people around us who have been sitting on the sidelines, just making all these excuses for why they haven't done what they wanted to do. And so they're so quick to tell you why your thing is not going to happen. And the more you get lit up about what you want to do, and the more you talk about it, some people are going to say to you that you're crazy and it's never going to be. Believe me, I get it. I had people begging me not to do this, telling me I was crazy telling me that that would happen for other people, but it doesn't happen for us. You know, people think like that happens for other people, but not for us. And I refuse to believe that. And I want everyone I ever meet, whether they're the waitress who's serving me delicious coffee or the person I'm sitting next to um, in an Uber or the person I'm talking to on a plane or any friend of mine, every time I meet someone, the question I want to ask them is, what do you want to do? Why are you here? Why are you here every single day? What do you wake up for? And what do you have to contribute? And what's gonna make you feel the most happy, the most fulfilled, the most authentic, the most like yourself? That's always my question. It's so easy to get so down on ourselves or to think that it's such a pipe dream or it's never gonna happen. But no one that you look up to in any field who's so, so successful, it's not because somebody handed it to them. It's because they were willing to persist. But there are some things that you can do. And so I've decided I'm gonna start putting up cheat sheets. I wanna give you some content. I wanna teach you some things that I think are really important. So every week I'm gonna put up a new cheat sheet. And if you go to nodayjobs.com, you can download it. So this week, the cheat sheet I put out is all about content. And here's just something I want to tell you. One of the things that you have to keep in mind is that whatever it is that you're doing, whether you're an artist or whether you have a store or whether you're a designer, whatever it is you're doing, the best way for you to start to make headway is for you to create content. Everything in sales is about content. People are so overdosed on ads. They don't want to see an ad. They don't want to know from an ad. So the best thing you can do to gain traction is not to sell to somebody, but to give to somebody. And so many brands now have this so figured out. And so let me give you a few examples. Like Whole Foods, you know, instead of putting up just ads, one of the things that they're spending a lot of money doing is creating content. So if you go to the Whole Foods website, you're going to see all these articles and they have a blog on healthy food and healthy living and all of that stuff. And they know that that's something that their customer really wants. And so instead of just trying to put up another ad, they're saying, how can I engage my customer? And so they're going to educate people on how to build a lifestyle that's healthy. And then people are going to go there for content. And then while they're absorbing that content as an offshoot, they're going to naturally buy things from Whole Foods. Um, Coca-Cola is like an amazing example. So, you know, they're one of the best known brands in the world. And one thing that they're always doing is they're trying to give you some experience. So they made you part of the experience. They were trying to create something that they knew that their target market would find fun and to make it feel like it was an empowering, fun experience. So that was the whole thing there. There's so many brands that do this, but the idea is you can create content, whatever it is you're doing. So let's say you are a therapist, right? Let's say you specialize in families. 
you could start to put out a blog and talk about things that are really helpful. And you can educate people on things that you think are so essential when it comes to parenting or things that are essential in your relationship. And as you're putting out content that people are absorbing as an offshoot, people are going to come to notice you and come to understand what you do. And you're going to become an expert in that. It's the same thing no matter what you're doing. You know, if you have a bakery, so you can, like I've said before, you can start posting things that you think people might want to absorb. What are the things that people might be interested in? Can you talk about some recipes? Can you show people what you were doing? And if you're a hat maker, can you show people videos of how you make these hats? And can you show people where you get the felt? Can you show people what kind of buttons you use? The more kinds of content that you are going to be creating, then instead of having to sell or instead of having to feel like you need to go knock on every door till somebody notices you, you're going to bring an audience to you by just creating content. Every single second, people are sitting on their phone looking for content and they're absorbing that content, whether it's on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook. So I want to start to show you how you can start getting busy creating content. I've started a few different businesses. You know, even this podcast, for example, you know, this was another thing that I felt I could be putting out there. I wanted to contribute. The more that you're thinking, what can you give? What can you teach? What can you share? What can you contribute? The more that things are going to start to come to you. I was doing these chats live online and I was talking to listeners and I was, people won raffles and I was talking to people about what they wanted to do. It was so much fun. One of the girls who was on the call, she has this great idea. So she has been all over the world and she wants to start to show people how There's so many similarities in all the different people she's met all over the world, and she wants to educate people on what's similar about different cultures. And she said, I would love to start to get hired to speak. And I said, well, start to brand yourself as an expert. She said, well, how would I do it? I said, start putting out a blog and talk about the different countries you've been to and post photos and post interesting things about different cultures and post quizzes and see if people can recognize, you know, based on the things that you're posting, whether that country that you're talking about is Costa Rica or Or are you really talking about Italy? Or is that really America? And then you can start to educate people. You can do videos. You can take some photos of places you've been around the world. You can go visit different places and do man on the street stuff and interview people and talk to people. And sooner or later, you're going to start to create an awareness around yourself. And people are going to come to you and say, can you speak at this meeting we're having? Can you speak at this organization? Can you speak at this charity dinner? You don't realize that right now you have this incredible audience. You have people right now waiting to absorb the content that you have to put out there. Years ago, we didn't have anything like this, but now if you can create content that's interesting, if you can create content that's fun, that's entertaining, that's educational, that contributes, you don't realize it, but every single day, online magazines and blogs and print magazines and and TV shows and morning shows, everyone's looking for content. So that's another thing. People are always looking to feature things. So a friend of mine I talked about on my first episode, um, she has a website called Entertaining with Emily and she's incredible. She's so talented. She's like Pinterest on steroids. She does everything and you want to hate her, but she's like the nicest girl in the world and she grew up on a farm and she's so sweet and so beautiful. And she creates gorgeous content because she makes these incredible parties and she makes all these handmade party favors and all these beautiful posters. And she, if you walked into her house, you'd never want to invite her to a party you threw because everything she does is so amazing. And the point is, she also takes photos of all of the beautiful scenes that she creates, whether it's a party for 4th of July or it's a birthday party and the theme is animals or the theme is unicorns or the theme is gymnastics or it's Valentine's Day or it's New Year's. She's always taking these incredible photos and she's throwing parties and she's staging things. She's doing a whole different variety of things and taking photos of it. And so she started posting this stuff and then soon people started coming to her because her content was so cool. And they said, can we feature it on our blog? Can we feature it in our online magazine? Can we feature it? Because everyone's looking for content. You become a squeaky wheel and I'm telling you, the doors are going to open. You're going to start to have more work than you ever even known possible. So that's one thing I want you to start to think about creating. And I made you guys a cheat sheet on how to create content. So if you go to nodayjobs.com, you can read some of the things that I'm talking about. But whatever it is you're doing, I want you to start thinking about what kinds of things can you be creating? Can you be posting pictures on Instagram? Can you be posting a blog? Can you be posting how to's? Can you be posting a cheat sheet? And then we're going to talk about list building. I'll talk about that in in our next episode. But I'm so excited because today we have this awesome example of what I'm talking about because Elise is here and Elise is amazing. And you can 
can go to her website, Elise Joy, and you can find out what she's been doing. But basically, she has a blog. She has a podcast. She's been creating so many different kinds of things. She does all these different kinds of crafts. We're going to hear her story now. And she's made an incredible life for herself. She's a mom. She has two little kids. And she's so successful. You know, you're going to hear the whole story. And I can't wait, actually, now that you're here, Elise, to hear all of this and how this all started. But it's so inspiring to see somebody doing their crafts, whether it's scrapbooking or decoupage or rubber stamps or whatever it is you've been doing. And I've just been seeing this from the sidelines, watching you post stuff online and listening to your podcast, but I can't wait to hear how you've been able to make such a good living doing all your crafts and doing what you love. So tell us how you started. Yeah, I think um, definitely my passion for business started when I was a kid, when I was, I mean, young, like six, you know, I was reading Babysitter's Club books and thinking about how cool that would be to, <laughs> to, you know, have a babysitter's club and make tons of money babysitting. And then I would come up with like random things, you know, around my house. Like I would set up a nail salon and it was like only my parents and my brother, you know, but I would paint so cute nails. Yeah. Like little <laughs> tiny projects. Um, and then in high school, I had a DIY frame business. Like I, I took wooden frames at Michael's and I took, you know, paper and Mod Podge and I, like created these custom frames for kids and I sold them for $10. And so it was like a boon around Mother's Day because it was like a $10 gift you could buy for your mom. So I did like I, I've so always – sweet. Thanks. Yes. I've always been like kind of that entrepreneur How mind. old were you when you were making those frames for Mother's Day? Yeah, that the big frames, boom. Yeah, the frames – the frames was – seven. I was 17. And I think I my profit was not huge. I think – I made a thousand dollars. I had a spreadsheet though, and I tracked. But a thousand dollars for a seventeen-year-old is a lot of money. Yeah, it was a big deal, you know. So <laughs> I, I definitely have always liked that. Um, I went to college for business, and I was business administration with an emphasis in marketing. And marketing in two thousand three through two thousand seven was so different than it is now, right? It, it's so traditional. So. At the time, you know, then there wasn't social media. There wasn't really internet marketing in the same way at all other than like garish banner ads. And so um, what I learned marketing-wise, I think, was very different um, at the time, but that was what my focus was. I always thought I would get a very normal job. I'd work in a tall building and I'd be this high-powered business exec. And that was kind of like – yeah, like that was the picture in my head. Um, but when I was graduating college, I, you know, your senior year, you apply for a bunch of jobs and I applied for tons. I like flew all over the country for interviews and I just could not get a job. And so I um, at the time was dating my now husband, boyfriend, and I decided to move out to Maryland where he was for med school. And I just moved in with him and got a job working at a retail store. Uh, so that was my first job out of college. I was making nine bucks an hour. and. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I had this degree, but it didn't matter because no one wanted to hire me for the jobs I wanted. So that was, I think, when my idea of what a career could look like had shifted. And in 2005, when I was a junior in college, I'd started a blog and I just shared pretty normal journaly entries about my life. And then I started sharing more craft projects. And that, so those two things, not getting hired and starting the blog kind of became the catalyst for getting things rolling and becoming self-employed. Wow. So cool. So what happened with that blog? So I got more serious about it. Like I, you know, in the beginning it was just fun. Um, And then, you know, as blogs started to become bigger deals, I took it more seriously and started to make sure that I had a post up, you know, every morning at 5 a.m. And I had an editorial calendar and I tried to be more practical about what I was sharing and a little bit more smart about what people wanted to read and what would get clicks. And it never grew into something crazy. I never hired a team of people to help. And I didn't have a ton of sponsored posts. I think in 10 years, I did six or seven. I made some money from affiliate programs, but very little money from advertising. And instead, the blog was just sort of a funnel that I used to help sell various products and workshops and things that I was working on. So so cool. I love yeah, this. I love yeah, this. I, I always said, you know, my blog is not my business, but my blog fuels my business. Um, so that, that worked out really great for me. Um, so it worked in that I wasn't trying to sell other people's stuff. I was trying to sell my own. So 
I guess for me that that was what felt the most authentic. Like I felt very comfortable writing a post about, hey, here's my product. Here's how it works. Look at this sample I made of it. I felt more comfortable with that than I felt with, hey, here's this really cool snack food. I love to eat right. it. Like it just and, and like I get like I think people do that really great. I don't do that great. I'm not good at that part. So for me, that's the way I wanted to use it. But it's so smart. Like you knew this before. Now there's been all these books and now there, now it's a thing that people know, you know, when you create content, that's how you're going to make commerce. Like your revenue mm-hmm. will come. But you were you just knew that intuitively. You created a blog before you even realized that this was going to be the catalyst for you to sell things and for you to create a whole world around yourself. So what were the first few things you were selling on the blog? Yeah, the very, very beginning, I was selling what I called mixed paper books. And they were little tiny scrapbooks that I put together with um, different pieces of paper and they were held together with like binder rings. And they were small, like four by six. And yeah, they were little scrapbooks. So I would obviously send them, you know, you'd buy them through my Etsy shop. And then you could add your own photos and your own handwriting to turn them into like little scrapbooks or journals. Those were the first couple of things I was selling. And then I took a letterpress class and learned how to letterpress print on these big old Vandercook machines. And so then I started selling letterpress prints, which was cool because not everyone wow yeah like not letterpress is a little bit more it's just more difficult to enter like you don't necessarily have access to a letterpress machine you know so that was something fun to sell those were like kind of my first couple products okay so you would put up a link to your etsy shop is that what you were saying yeah. and that you would talk about that on your blog okay so how long were you creating the blog before you started selling stuff on the blog Great question. So I started the blog in uh, December 2005, and I think I opened my Etsy shop in the spring of 2008, but it could have been the fall of 2007. So about, I'd say about two years where there was no money, not even a dream of money. What were you posting about when you were, you were talking about how you'd start to think what do people want to read and you were putting more thought into it every day? What were the kinds of things that you were posting about? What was the content? Yeah, in 2005, 2006, 2007, everyone was posting about themselves, right? Like, like it wasn't just, it, it wasn't the same. It wasn't a market. And so it was a journal and I would just share like, you know, here's what I'm up to. And, and I had just graduated college. I just moved cross country. And so there was things to share there. I was involved in scrapbooking at the time. So yeah, scrapbooking was a big, big deal where there were message boards and magazines. Yeah. So much was devoted to that. And so I would share various scrapbook projects Um, which is kind of how that transition then came to the mixed paper books. And again, like I was sharing because other people who were in the scrapbook community were sharing. And at the time, again, like there weren't as many people creating content. And so that was like, if you got, you know, a thousand views a day, that was a huge deal (laughs) or it, it felt like it. And so um, and you were became, and you were growing an audience by posting the link on message boards, like you were saying, chat yes. chat groups about scrapbooking. That was your that was yeah. the main anchor. Okay, exactly. so then what happened? There, um, there, there was nothing else. There's all that existed was message boards, um, and so then it kind of started getting bigger. Pinterest, you know, came on the scene and. That helped because people kind of started finding me through there. I think Pinterest was my largest traffic driver starting in like 2010. I got married. So I had a huge thing to blog about. Like we had a total DIY wedding. So I could blog about my flowers, blog about my invitations, you know, and kind of turn that into something. I made my own invitations. And so then I got requests to make other people's invitations, very small scale, like super little. But I really was just piecing together these tiny things. At the same time, I was working retail still. So I still had a job that got me out of the house, but I could kind of build this up, you know, slowly. On the side. Yeah. Okay. So you start selling these mixed paper books and then what happens? Um, Then I just got a little bit more legit with it. So in the beginning, the books were all unique. Like I would take scraps of what I had and put them together and then list five different, 10 different books um, completely. And then they'd sell out. And so I got more serious. Oh my gosh. Yeah, wow. I got a I got a um, retail license so I could start purchasing wholesale, and I started investing like a little tiny bit of my money into the business, and I would buy paper in bulk, you know, in various colors. I'd come up with themes for things, and then I'd launch instead of ten unique items, I would launch 
25 of the same item. So that was exciting. It was like a product line instead of these pieces. I could take photographs once but sell 25 things, you know. So right. that that's kind of when I started getting a little bit smarter about what it could be about. Um, and, and what again, were you saying? What, what were you selling when you were saying you were buying different colors of paper? What was the line of product? That was the same book. Mixed paper yep. books? Okay. Yep, mixed paper books. Then I started getting into theme. So I would do like a book for summer. So this idea would be like, you'd buy this book and capture your summer in the book. And, you know, then I would hype that. And every, because the blog was my main advertising place, I would just share like, here's how I'm working on my summer book. You know, if you want to buy one, here's a link. At the time, it just made sense to sell like this. Like now you would launch a product and then you'd kind of back into sharing how to do it. Um, But at the time I wanted to be working on this stuff and it was a fun way to make some money (laughs) to like- Amazing. Yeah, to share with other people. It was so genuine. And it was so yeah. earnest, but you're <laughs> yeah. right. Now people do a whole pre-launch campaign and they're using the exact techniques that you use, but yours were like just you <laughs> organically doing it. It's, it is kind of crazy. People study exactly what you did naturally. People like try to study that now and figure out how to do that. Okay, so then you're sell- you're making themes and books on summer and you're talking mm-hmm. about that. And then what was the next wave of things you sold? So okay, Lee, we're getting now to like 2010. I got married and my husband and I moved back across the country to San Diego. And then I was working on decorating our house. And in the process of that, I was like making artwork for our walls. So I made a few prints that were 11 by 14 and hung them in my house. And people, and again, shared them on the blog. People like those. So I started selling prints, um, just 11 by 14, almost like photo posters. So that was kind of the next wave. That launched a whole wave of prints um, that I sold in various colorways and with different designs. And yeah, that that was kind of phase two of the business. And at this point, when we moved to San Diego, that's when I quit my day job. At the time, for a while, when I was in retail, I was an assistant manager and my salary was $30,000. And so I told my husband when we moved to San Diego, instead of getting a job, I was going to work on doing my own thing and I was going to try to make $30,000. And that was kind of our agreement. Like if in this one year I could make what I was making at a real job, then that meant I didn't have to get a real job. <laughs> so, sure. Yeah. yeah so, so that became the goal. And yeah, I never had a real job since. So that's good. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. You're so creative. Every time you're talking, like I'm seriously, my face like lights up. Like I get like so excited. I love hearing how creative you are and how you just put stuff out there and you don't scrutinize it so much. Like at least no. that's not how it sounds. I love that. I mean, that's so freeing. So you're now you're decorating your house. You're talking about the stuff you're making for your walls. And then what happens? Simultaneously during this time, I started teaching online workshops. And so in the beginning, those were workshops about scrapbooking. Um, And then I taught a workshop about, I guess it was like another kind of scrapbooking workshop. Then a big kind of business boost was I taught a workshop about blogging that was specifically about customizing your TypePad blog. Because I was on TypePad. TypePad at the time was still big. Um, You could do a lot with it, but it wasn't very user friendly. You had to do a lot of web coding. And so it was difficult. Like you had to spend a lot of time Googling to figure out all this stuff. And I had taken a web design class in college. And so a lot of it I understood, a lot of it I could figure out. And so I taught an online workshop that was $115. So again, like at the time that felt like a lot of money and still does feel like a lot of money. So people took that class, I think it was a month long or something, and I created all the content for that. And that felt like a big thing. That was a high ticket item that was getting people interested. That that kind of felt like a big business milestone to launch that. So that was next. Wow. How many people wound up taking that class? The first class I kept it deliberately at 35 or maybe 40 because I didn't – one of the things I offered in the class was like one-on-one help. And right. so you I was going to yeah. – yeah, so I was very nervous that I'd be inundated with questions and it would be terrible. But as usual, you know, there's always like one or two people who are tons of questions and then everyone else doesn't have any questions. And so that worked out great. I think I reran that class four times, always with about 40, 35 people. Amazing. And I would just, I would run it like every six months. 
Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. You probably made like twenty thousand dollars from just doing yeah. that. Yeah, not bad. <laughs> not bad. I'll do it. It's not. It's not frames, but it was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so then what happens? The next thing I did after that was. I launched a rubber stamp business. So again, this is a project where I was still like doing a lot of paper crafting and I wanted really simple rubber stamps. And at the time there didn't feel like there were a ton on the market. So I started, I made my own, like I I, I ordered custom stamps for myself, shared them on the blog. They were popular enough that I launched a line of stamps and I kept that going for at least 18 months, maybe two years. And I would just come out you know, every four months with new designs. And those sold really great, but they were expensive to produce. And Mm -hmm. you can't charge that much for a stamp, right? So it was, I was doing massive quantity sales, but my margins were like $3, you know? So it takes a lot of $3 sales to turn into a business. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're so you're so creative. You're like this magical, sparkly unicorn. Like I every day, you're like, and then I did this, and I'm like, what? Yeah. How does she have no, this many I, ideas? When you roll it like through, like I never think of it like this because the thing that's so important, I think, is that it's you know ten years. So when when I roll it out, I'm like so then this, and then this. You know, when I say it in fifteen minutes, it sounds like a lot, but you have to remember that it's just it's been so long, also. <laughs> Right. Everybody's not there behind the scenes. And also you're doing this, just putting one foot in front of the other. It's not like you Mm -hmm. knew the next 20 steps. You just knew the next step. And so you would just do the next thing. Yeah. So um, the next thing that came after that was I did a project called Make 29. And this is when things started to click in a a different way, I think. I think um, prior to this, so for the, you know, eight years of trying to do my own thing, um, this is where things started to feel a little bit more deliberate. Um, and I was still putting one foot in front of the other, but I was thinking a little bit more about where I was placing my foot. So Make 29 was a project when I turned 29. I turned 29 in February. And then every month on the 22nd of every month, I launched launched a limited edition product. And the products were in editions of 29 or 290. And wow. the, the goal of the project was for me to figure out what do I want to do? I knew I was over stamps, but I didn't know what would be next. I didn't know what kind of business I wanted to follow through on. And so I kind of figured, okay, I can do these small batch launches. I can try sewing things. I can try more prints. I can try posters, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of this year, I'm going to have an idea of what's going to work. So that was kind of how I went into it. I had a few of the months planned out, but for the most part, they just kind of developed. You know, I thought about them as, as I went. Wow. And it was amazing. I mean, it was a life-changing product project for me in that it was such a big project to undertake. It was so or it was so satisfying to finish. And some of the months were more successful than others, but all of them were good. Yeah, and so I finished that in 2015, I think. And at the end of that project, I realized I didn't want to do any of those things. I didn't want to be a painter or a <laughs> professional sewer or anything. None of that mattered. But I realized what I was really good at was coming up with projects and then working towards these projects and executing. And so that's how Get to Workbook came. It was like, I'm going to take everything I've learned for the past 30 years of goal setting and put it into this book and help other people do the same. So tell us about Get to Workbook. So I know this is your your premier thing that you do now. (laughs) What is the Get to Workbook? Tell us about yes. it. Yes. Get to Workbook is a day planner slash goal setting workbook. So I have two editions. One is like a traditional calendar, January through December, and one runs more of an academic year that goes July through June. So it's a 12-month planner, and it's fairly standard as a planner in that it has you know weekly spreads and daily columns, um, but it also has these features added in that are designed to help you set goals and help you reach goals. Um, so there are plenty of um, videos and photos on the website if it if that helps you. But the point is to kind of think big picture, like look at your year as a whole, look at your week as a whole, figure out what you need to get done, um, but then recognize that every day is when you're actually doing the things, right? So how can you break down huge projects? How can you break down huge goals into more manageable steps and manageable action items and then work towards them? Well, what are some things that you learned when you were going through that year? And like you said, in the 
totality of your life, what do you feel like are some of the ways that people can actually make it happen versus like you said, it can be overwhelming, but day to day, you've got to take action. So what are some ideas you have that you can talk to us about? Oh man, there's so many things. Okay. One of the biggest things is we all are, I hate just, I hate the word busy, but we all have a lot of things going um, at once. And so you have to be able to separate out those items. You have to be able to separate the most important from the least important and then recognize the difference. I think a lot of people will have a full to-do list but then they check their email and more things come in, right? Like more work comes in through your inbox and right. you don't know how to prioritize that work. You don't know like, is this email from Susie something I need to be doing right now or yeah. should I be going through my list? So I think the number one problem is prioritizing. So there's a feature in Get to Work book that talks about, you know, this upcoming month, what do I need to get done? Like what has to be completed? Um, what needs to just to be worked on, like what what would be great if I made progress on, but isn't crazy, you know, doesn't have a deadline. And then third, like what's kind of on the back burner? What am I thinking about? Because sometimes I think just writing down those things and sorting them out takes them out of your head and it can yes. help you recognize like, I don't need to be worrying about Johnny's birthday in, you know, April. It doesn't matter like right now. So I think sometimes just getting it down can help. I think being aware of what you actually have to do. So keeping that list, whether it's on your phone or on your computer or in your email or on paper, um, keeping a list of what you're actually working on can really help you stay focused. Um, mm -hmm. So that's key. And then this, the third part is kind of when you want to do something. So you want to launch a business it's not worrying so much about step seven, right? Like today you need to worry about step one. Like you need to do one thing today. And, and I think that's where we really get screwed up is we look at a huge project. We think that's impossible. I can't do it. And then therefore we don't even get started. Like if you come up with an idea and you start to kind of walk your way through every single thing you need to do to execute this idea, you will panic and, and you won't right. do anything because it's going to feel and it is extremely daunting. And so I think figuring out that first step, doing that first thing, and then continuing to move forward, you know, slowly from there is important. Um, and what I found more than anything is sometimes you just have to get the ball rolling. So you just start, you do the first thing, and then that gives you the energy to try the second and the third and the fourth and suddenly, right, this huge, massive project can feel a little bit more manageable. And right. so when you're feeling extremely overwhelmed and when it all feels terrible, focus on just finding that first thing to work on and get that done. And then we could go in. I mean, there's so many things. It's like holding yourself accountable and deadlines and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, but that tends to be the hardest. Two things that come up all the time for our listeners, people write this to me all the time. One thing is they're like, you don't understand. I don't have any time. How do you carve out time when you're pretty sure that you don't have it? Like you're working your job, you've got kids. I get that, but there's got to be a way for people to carve out time. So what do you think? Yeah, very fair. I think that's a real thing. Feeling that stress is a real thing. Part of what you can do is come up with like, okay, one night. So maybe when you get off work on Wednesday nights, that's your night where you have three hours and you're a babysitter or a friend of yours or your partner handles the kids and everyone knows that Wednesday nights are your night to get something done. And then on that Wednesday night, like you go to, you hold up in the bathroom of your house or you go to Starbucks or you get out and you work on whatever that project is, whatever you need to get rolling. And there's no distractions. You don't spend that time on Instagram. Like exactly. you really separate for that. I think there, there's got to be two hours a week that you can devote to you and to whatever that project is that you need to be working on. And you're probably thinking two hours isn't enough. I need 15 hours. Yes, exactly. Right. People say that all the time. Yeah. And it's like, well, what have you done with two? You know, like I think a lot of times we feel like we don't have, and this is me too. Like right now, um, I don't have childcare for my younger daughter. And so I kind of rely on like either when my husband is home or when she's napping or my mom is in town like right now where I can do this call. So right now I need to like be growing my wholesale program and, and really expanding that. And I feel like I don't have time. I don't have time to sit down and spend the hours and hours that I need to do. But what I do know is that I can break it up into chunks and come up with really specific things and then 
when I get that time, like when I do have that two hours or when I do have that help, like really work. And, and I think it's hard. It is so difficult to get yourself in the mood to really crank it out. But there's like nothing as like fueling and exciting as when you are able to get there. The other thing that comes up, I was saying there's two things. The other thing that comes up is people feel like they're afraid to start because they think that they're not good enough or they're not ready enough or they don't want to put it out there because they don't have it all figured out. Like everyone has this self-doubt stuff and you being able to go for it and create as much as you've created, you have some confidence. How do you overcome that if you're somebody who's like, I don't want to start because... I don't even know what I'm going to work on is even good enough or where to begin. I think in those cases, it's kind of another situation where maybe you start smaller. I could have never launched a product like Get to Workbook 10 years ago or even, you know, five or four years. Like I couldn't have done it earlier. I, I didn't have not only like the um, understanding of how to do something like this, but I, I, I didn't. I didn't have the bravery. Like I couldn't have, you know, it built up over time by small projects that I felt more comfortable with. Right. Um, I think that there is though an important part where any risk you take is going to feel uncomfortable. So if you think that the sign to get started is you're going to feel comfortable and confident, that sign is never coming. Like that, that will not happen. So it's sort of recognizing that you're never going to feel super confident. You're never going to feel super comfortable. But that's kind of how you know that, that it's a risk right. to take. I wouldn't say like you want to be just like covered in hives and, and under your bed <laughs> hiding. Like that, that's not the discomfort we're looking for. But it's never going to feel great. And so part of it is just sort of getting over this idea that it ever will. <laughs> I see. Yeah, I love that. And so now give us a snapshot, you know, because – it's not bragging, it's inspiring. Tell us that people listening can hear where this blog 10 years ago, 12 years ago, where this has led you. How many people are buying from you? What's your audience? How many people read the blog? How many people listen to your podcast? Tell us a snapshot of where you're at. Yeah, good question. So the blog, I, I stopped writing the blog when right before my younger daughter Piper was born um, because – so this is something interesting, but well, I was feeling like I needed to pull back. And so I wanted to be selling Get to Workbook. Um, I wanted to be doing my job, but I didn't want my life and my job to be overlapping as much. And so I no longer write the blog daily. So if you go to it, it's at enjoyitblog.com. You'll see 10 years of archives and you'll see a few posts from the past year. So that I no longer do. I, I couldn't tell you what my numbers are on that. With um, the podcast, again, I'm kind of on a little hiatus. I'll be coming back in July. My lessons are not crazy. I think my episodes are downloaded right now like 12 to 14,000 times, which is great, but not like insane. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. And then with Get to Work book, I sell about last year in just product sales, $500,000 worth of gross. So that that's where amazing. I took Amazing. So how many yeah. did you sell? So with Gets Workbook in the summer, almost 3,000. In the winter, oh 4,000. But oh, I've expanded that's the product amazing. line. So now, thanks. Yeah. So now there's a lot oh of different God. products all under the Get to Workbook umbrella. And and that's something that I want to keep growing. And obviously, and of course, I didn't pocket 500000 There's so much expense that Excellent. goes into sure, a business sure. like this. But you're, you're doing okay. Uh, yeah, exactly. I am. I'm, I'm very, very happy with where the business is and what it contributes to my family. And I like Amazing. it. I like my job a lot. You're making more money than some people who are lawyers and doctors doing something that you absolutely love that's 100% authentic to your personality and you're contributing yeah you're contributing you. to the world well i make <laughs> i'm making more money gross <laughs> than some lawyers or doctors <laughs> well yeah I my, mean, my take home is smaller <laughs> still i mean and you're not even having to work full time it's incredible thank you thank you yeah it's i mean i i'm excited wow so what are the other products that you're selling so now under the Get to Work book umbrella, there are planner accessories. So there's like a bookmark that snaps into the book. Um, and then there's a lot of different notepads that kind of take the features of the book. So there's a perpetual calendar notepad where you could look at a week at a glance and, you know, create your to-do list on there. Um, there's sticky notes and washi tape, even enamel pins made out of the artwork and wall calendars. And so I 
again, like I didn't think about that. Like when I came up with Get to Work book, I wasn't thinking, oh, and then this could be a product line and blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, as you work on something and you see what works and you see exactly. what customers are responding to, right. you can adjust. And so, okay, a couple things. This is amazing. Okay. Are you also giving a course to teach people how to use these products or it's just right now products because you're with your kids and you're making these products? Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I think that's probably a weakness and a missed opportunity for the brand is that I don't do as much like I would never charge for a course for it, but I could do much more like free training, I guess, for people who want it. I have a bunch of videos on the website, or I have three videos on the website that kind of walk through the book and talk about the features and how they're designed to be used. Um, I use Instagram as my main marketing tool and I showcase what people are you know, doing with the book. Um, so Very cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that, that helps for sure. I mean, without a doubt, I notice sales increase when I promote something very specific on, on the Instagram feed, you know, how it's been used. But I could be doing much more. And I hope that when my kids are both in daycare, I can focus on something like that. I think that people's understanding and then kind of education around your products is a great selling tool that I should be working on for sure. Okay, so, so two questions about what you're doing. One is, how do you get the stuff made? Let's say I'm listening to this and I'm so inspired, I wanna buy the Get to Work book and then start working on a project. How are you getting your stuff made when you're making a notepad? Where is that being created? So that's the number one question that I tend to get. I think it's the number one holdup for people is they're like, I don't know how to produce my products. Right, exactly. And um, yeah, my answer is, you know, I don't necessarily either. I spend a lot of time on Google. So the book itself and all of the notepads right now are printed up in Portland, Oregon. Um, the reason for that is my designers are from the design from Jolvi and Friends, which is also up in Portland. And they had this connection for a printer up there. And I went with him and he's great. Like the product has been great. I'm happy with the paper. Everything's good. So right now, notepads and books are printed up in Portland. Other items like the bookmarks, I Googled and, yeah. and got samples and worked with a couple different companies. So this is what it means to be resourceful. Like you don't have a factory in your back bedroom, but you find it. You find someone yeah. who's going to create it for you. Exactly. Yeah, you do. And you you ask them questions and you send them emails and you demand samples and you ask what can be custom and what cannot and what are the minimum quantities. And, and it, it's really creating a back and forth. It's getting comfortable. It's all doable. Yeah. Oh, my other question is, so you mentioned Instagram, but what are all the avenues now what are the platforms in which you're selling the Get to Work book and anything else you're creating? I sell everything through my website is hosted by Big Cartel. So it's nothing crazy fancy at all, but it looks great. It works fine. So I sell through Big Cartel. My Instagram is by far my main driver. That's the platform that I am the most passionate about. So it's the easiest for me to use. Mm -hmm. um, I have a virtual assistant who monitors my Get to Work book Facebook page, but I don't use Facebook. And so it's not a great method for me to interact with customers, but of course there's a ton of customers there. So it's good to have that. And then everything is obviously Pinterest friendly, but I don't use Pinterest really as a driver myself. So, you know, I hope that people pin and then buy it through there, but that's not something I tend to do. So what your main driver is Instagram? My, my main driver is Instagram. Yes. Interesting. Because there's obviously tons of stuff you can be doing, but you've set up your life so that you can have time with your girls and time to do your work. And you're not doing every single possible avenue, but the one that you're using is clearly working. I mean, look what's come from this, that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not to say that, like, I can't tell you, I think every day I get emails about, you know, here's how you can improve this. Here's how you can be doing this. And, you know, I'm just on like, I'm some sort of chain where they send it to everyone. Yeah, I'm like, well, you know, I, I'm happy with where I'm at. And, and I'm, I'm at a season of my life where, I'd rather do less than more. Like, of course, that means less money sometimes, but I feel like it's manageable right now. And I think that's probably one of the most important things while my girls are so little is that what I'm doing feels manageable. That's not to say I don't have days where I'm completely panicked, but most days I wake up feel, feeling comfortable and confident with what's on my list. And that feeling to me is worth so much more than eyeballs. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to kind of keep, keep it there. Amazing. It's such a cool story. And I love how healthy you are. Like you're, you're still that same girl who clearly came from such a 
magical place because you're, you know here you are you've sort of figured out the ingredients to being successful and you're still doing it in a way that feels measurable that feels like you can handle that feels like you can still give it your all and love it that's very unique i don't think everybody is in that spot well thank you yeah i think i saw something that someone said um and i, I don't even know if this is their quote or it's just a common quote but like overnight successes take 10 years and I just I, I haven't related as much to something um, as that. I don't think that there is a shortcut. I think it's about trying a lot of things. I think I was in the right place in the right time. Like I started my blog at the right time and I invested in different things slowly enough, you know, that it could kind of grow. It never snowballed. It just kind of got a little bit, you know, a little bit bigger, but I was like getting stronger at the same time. So it's kind of like, you know, as your kids grow – you can carry them because you're getting stronger as you're carrying them as they're growing. So they're growing, but you're getting stronger. And so I think that's kind of how this has just been. It's like I've taken on new things as I've gotten a little bit better at doing it. And then that's allowed the business to grow. That's a terrible analogy, but no, it's not. It's great. So two last things. Number one, where can people find your stuff? Just give us clearly the website you want to send people to for the get to work book or whatever. I would say the best place to start is elisejoy.com because if you go there, you can get a link to my social media sites, my blog, and get to workbook. But yeah, get to workbook is at gettoworkbook.com. But Elise Joy is like my online hub. Awesome. How much is get to workbook for people before they? So 55 when it's full price and the July through June book will be launching in April. But right now the January through December book is discounted. Um, it's 15% off with free shipping. So Right now, it's like 46 79 75 <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, and finally, if you're talking to someone, you know, you're having coffee with someone who's so inspired by you and they also have this dream, but they haven't taken the steps you've taken, what's your advice? <sighs> it's so hard to not be trite. I think that my advice is to start small and focus on something that you can do today to get closer to what you're trying to do. Um, don't panic. Like don't let yourself get overwhelmed and realize that there is a space for everyone's idea. I think that's it. I think there's always a space for a good idea. So don't worry so much about being the fastest or the cheapest or the best. Just if you have a good idea, work on that first step to turning it into something. God, I love that. That's so nice. Okay, I said that was my last question, but one, my final question, when you have moments, which I, th I think you might, although it doesn't seem like you do, but if you ever have a moment where you feel like you hit a wall, how do you recommit yourself when you're feeling that scared, overwhelmed, or just that self-doubt? Like, how do you keep going? What do you think of? What do you use? How do you get back on the bike? Yeah, awesome question. I hit walls all the time, both personally and professionally. And I think um, what helps me is like realizing that this wall is not different than other walls I've hit. So whatever current crisis you're in usually feels like the worst crisis ever um, because you're in it. But I think that what I like to try is just perspective on like kind of reminding myself, you know, remember when I got through that or remember when I did this or whatever. And so that kind of helps me realize that this will not be the end. And then I think the second thing that is important is you have to give yourself downtime. You know, like we can't be 100% productive and up all the time people. You can't do that forever. And so you have to allow yourself to kind of have those down moments and realize that you'll get it back. Um, but there's there's kind of value, I think, sometimes in like letting it be. Like being a little bummed is not bad. This was so much fun. Thank you so much for sharing all this with us. Everybody should go check out and get the Get to Work book. It makes a lot of sense to start working on things every day. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. What a pleasure. And that's so kind. So thank you. <laughs> Oh, that was so much fun to listen to. I love that story. I love how you've created a life for yourself, doing what you love, making an amazing living, and you have two little girls and you're just doing it all. Okay, so here are some of my takeaways. Number one, sometimes less is more. You don't always have to look for more. Do what's manageable. You can be happy with where you're at. Number two, sometimes overnight successes can take 10 years. Sometimes they don't, but sometimes they do. 
Number three, don't panic. Don't get overwhelmed by the whole process. Start small and focus on something small that you can do today. Number four, there's always a space for a good idea. And number five, if you feel like you're in a crisis, just remember all the other obstacles you've already overcome. Thank you so much for listening to our show. We love you. Everybody on our team is constantly talking about this amazing audience and how engaged everyone is. I love that you come to the Facebook page. So if you haven't been, please follow us on Facebook, post what you're up to. Let us know what you're doing. I do Facebook live. So you're going to get to see me. I want to connect with more of you. I love getting to do that. If you want to support our show, leave a review for us on iTunes. Tell your friends about it. Share the podcast. Thank you for continue to come back and listen. We will continue to bring you great episodes. We've got so many cool things coming up. We'll talk to you soon. I want to give a shout out to the amazing team who makes this show possible. Special thanks to our executive producer, Tim Street and producer Emma Kikuchi. The podcast is a production of Authentic. For more info on advertising in this show, visit AuthenticShows.com.